Chapter 29 The ship is lying here in the harbor of Naples, quarantined. She has been here several days and will remain several more. We that came by rail from Rome have escaped this misfortune. Of course, no one is allowed to go on board the ship or come ashore from her. She is a prison now. The passengers probably spend the long, blazing days looking out from under the awnings at Vesuvius and the beautiful city, and in swearing. Think of ten days of this sort of pastime. We go out every day in a boat and request them to come ashore. It soothes them. We lie ten steps from the ship and tell them how splendid the city is and how much better the hotel fare is here than anywhere else in Europe and how cool it is and what frozen continents of ice cream there are and what a time we are having convorting about the country and sailing to the islands in the bay this tranquilizes them ascent of Vesuvius I shall remember our trip to Vesuvius for many a day, partly because of its sightseeing experiences, but chiefly on account of the fatigue of the journey. Two or three of us had been resting ourselves upon the tranquil and beautiful scenery of the island of Ischia, eighteen miles out in the harbor, for two days. We called it resting but I do not remember now what the resting consisted of, for when we got back to Naples we not, had not slept for forty-eight hours. We were just about to go to bed early in the evening and catch up on some sleep we had lost when we heard of this Vesuvius expedition. There was to be eight of us in the party, and we were to leave Naples at midnight. We laid in some provisions for the trip, engaged carriages to take us to Annunciation, and then moved about the city to keep awake till twelve. We got away punctually, and in the course of an hour and a half arrived at the town of Annunciation. Annunciation is the very last place under the sun. In other towns in Italy, the people lie around quietly and wait for you to ask them a question or do some overt act that can be charged for. But in Annunciation they have lost even that fragment of delicacy. They seize a lady's shawl from a chair and hand it to her and charge her a penny. They open a carriage door and charge for it. Shut it when you get out and charge for it. They help you take off a duster, two cents. Brush your clothes and make them worse than they were before, two cents. Smile upon you two cents. Bow with a lick-spittle smirk, hat in hand, two cents. They volunteer all information, such as that the mules will arrive presently, two cents. Warm day, sir, two cents. Take you four hours to make the ascent, two cents. And so they go. They crowd you, infest you, swarm about you, and sweat and smell offensively, and Look sneaking and mean and obsequious. There's no office too degrading for them to perform for money. I've had no opportunity to find out anything about the upper classes by my observations, but from what I hear said about them, I judge that what they lack in one or two of the bad traits of the canali have, they make up for in one or two others that are worse. How the people beg. Many of them are well-dressed, too. I said I knew nothing about the upper classes by personal observation. I must recall it. I had forgotten. What I saw their bravest and their fairest do last night, the lowest multitude that could be scraped up out of the purliest of Christendom would blush to do, I think. They assembled by hundreds and even thousands in the great theater of San Carlo to do what? Why, simply to make fun of an old woman, to deride, to hiss, to jeer at an actress they once worshipped, but whose beauty has faded now and whose voice has 
lost its former richness. Everybody spoke of the rare sport there was to be. They said the theater would be crammed because Frizzolini was going to sing. It was said she could not sing well now, but then the people liked to see her anyhow. And so we went, and every time the woman sang, they hissed and laughed the whole magnificent house, and as soon as she left the stage, they called her on again with applause. Once or twice she was encored, five or six times in succession, and received with hisses when she appeared, and discharged with hisses and laughter when she had finished, then instantly encored and insulted again. And how the high-born knaves enjoyed it! White-kitted gentlemen and ladies laughed till the tears came and clapped their hands in very ecstasy when that unhappy old woman would come meekly out for the sixth time, with uncomplaining patience, to meet a storm of hisses. It was the cruelest exhibition, the most wanton, the most unfeeling. The singer would have conquered an audience of American rowdies by her brave, unflinching tranquility, for she answered encore after encore, and smiled and bowed pleasantly, and sang the best she possibly could, and went bowing through all the jeers and hisses, without ever losing her countenance or temper. And surely in any other land than Italy her sex and her helplessness must have been an ample protection to her. She could have needed no other. Think what a multitude of small souls were crowded into that theater last night. If the manager could have filled his theater with Neapolitan souls alone, without the bodies, he could not have cleared less than ninety millions of dollars. What traits of character must a man have to enable him to help three thousand miscreants to hiss and jeer and laugh at one friendless old woman and shamefully humiliate her. He must have all the vile, mean traits there are. My observations persuades me, I do not like to venture beyond my own personal observations, that the upper classes of Naples possess those traits of character. Otherwise, they may be very good people, I cannot say. Ascent of Vesuvius continued. In the city of Naples, they believe in and support one of the wretchedest of all the religious impostures one can find in Italy, the miraculous liquefaction of the blood of St. Januarius. Twice a year, the priests assemble all the people at the cathedral and get out this vial of clotted blood and let them see it slowly dissolve and become liquid. And every day for eight days this dismal farce is repeated while the priests go among the crowd and collect money for the exhibition. The first day the blood liquefies in 47 minutes. The church is crammed. Then and time must be allowed the collectors to get around. After it liquefies a little quicker and a little quicker every day as the houses grow smaller till on the eighth day, with only a few dozens present to see the miracle, it liquefies in four minutes. And here also they used to have a grand procession of priests, citizens, soldiers, sailors, and the high dignitaries of the city government once a year to shave the head of a made-up Madonna, a stuffed and painted image, like a milliner's dummy, whose hair miraculously grew and restored itself every twelve months. They still keep up this shaving procession as late as four or five years ago. It was a source of great profit to the church that possessed this remarkable effigy, and the ceremony of the public barbering of her was always carried out with the greatest possible eclat and display. The more the better, because the more excitement there was about it, the larger the crowds it drew, and the heavier the revenues it produced. But at last the day came when the Pope and his servants were unpopular in Naples, and the city government stopped the Madonna's annual show. 
There we have two specimens of these Neapolitans, two of the silliest possible frauds which half the population religiously and faithfully believed, and the other half either believed also or else said nothing about, and thus lent themselves to the support of the imposture. I'm very well satisfied to think that the whole population believed in those poor, cheap miracles. The people who want two cents every time they bow to you and who abuse a woman are capable of it, I think. The ascent of Vesuvius continued. These Neapolitans always ask four times as much money as they intend to take, but if you give them what they first demand, they feel ashamed of themselves for aiming so low and immediately ask for more. When money is to be paid and received, there is always some vehement jawing and gestulating about it. One cannot buy and pay for two cents worth of clams without trouble and a quarrel. One course in a two-horse carriage costs a franc. That is law. But the hackman always demands more on some pretense or other, and if he gets it, he makes a new demand. It is said that a Stranger took a one-horse carriage for a course, tariff half a franc. He gave the man five francs by way of experiment. He demanded more and received another franc. Again he demanded more and got a franc, demanded more, and it was refused. He grew vehement, was again refused, and became noisy. The stranger said, Well, give me the seven francs again, and I'll see what I can do. And when he got them, he handed the hackman half a franc, and he immediately asked for two cents to buy a drink with. It may be thought that I'm prejudiced. Perhaps I am. I would be ashamed of myself if I were not. The scent of Vesuvius continued. Well, as I was saying, we got our mules and horses. After an hour and a half of bargaining with a population of Annunciation and started sleepily up the mountain, with a vagrant at each mule's tail who pretended to be driving the brute along, but was really holding on and getting himself dragged up instead. I made slow headway at first, but I began to get dissatisfied at the idea of paying my minion five francs to hold my mule back by the tail, and keep him from going up the hill, and so I discharged him, and I got along faster then. We had one magnificent picture of Naples from a high point on the mountain side. We saw nothing but the gas lamps, of course. Two thirds of a circle skirting the great bay, a necklace of diamonds glinting through the darkness from the remote distance. Less brilliant than the stars overhead, but more softly, richly beautiful over the great city, the lights crossed and recrossed each other and many and many a sparkling line and curve. And back of the town, far round, abroad over the miles of level Campania, were scattered rows and circles and clusters of lights, all glowing like so many gems, and marking where a score of villages were sleeping. About this time, the fellow who was hanging on to the tail of the horse in front of me and practicing all sorts of unnecessary cruelty upon the animal, got kicked some fourteen rods, and this incident, together with the fairy spectacle of the lights far in the distance, made me serenely happy, and I was glad I started to Vesuvius. Ascent of Mount Vesuvius continued. The subject will be excellent matter for a chapter, and tomorrow or next day I will write it.